What kind of place is this world? Is it a chaotic world? Or an ordered world? Um, is it ruled by chance? Or fate? Or God? And who am I? Um, what am I here for? Is there any meaning to my life? For many people, these are the biggest questions um, people have been asking them forever since the events of Genesis chapter 1. And I think a lot of people would say that the answers are elusive. We, we can't really know. People have tried all sorts of different angles, haven't they, to answer these questions. Philosophical reasoning, scientific methods, uh, religious arguments. And we now live in a time and a place where many people invent their own meaning. Um, today, the answers to the questions, who am I, and what am I here for, are, are not something that can be imposed on my life. It's whatever I want it to be. In fact, it's a commandment of our culture, isn't it? To be true to yourself. Be who you want to be. People would say it's immoral to impose meaning or purpose or identity onto anybody else. As one author puts it, we are plastic people who are able to change our identity and purpose whenever and however we want. But however elusive you know, that the people might think the answers to these questions are, maybe you are here this morning and, and you might have those exact questions, and if so, it's great that you're here. Because however elusive people might think the answers are, as we open up Genesis 1 and 2, we find that the answers are right here. Not the answers that we give ourselves, but the answers that God gives us about ourselves and our world. Our temptation as human beings is to, to shake our fists at God. We want to reserve the right to define our own reality. But actually what Genesis 1 and 2 tells us is good news. Because what we find here is the maker's instructions, his very good design. Actually, all of the things that we find sad and messy in our world today all stem, indirectly or more directly, from the fact that we failed to listen to his instructions. We failed to take heed of God's answers to these questions. We've made up our own answers. And we'll hear more about that as we come up to Genesis 3 next week. But for now, this morning, here in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to see how things were meant to be. And I'm sure you noticed, as it was read, um, if you were here last week as well, that to some extent that the events of chapter 2 are a repeat of what's already happened in chapter 1. Um, in chapter 1 we saw that men and women were created on day 6, and now here in chapter 2 we get it all over again. And we read again about men and women being created, but the action is slowed right down now. It's as if we're zooming in on day 6, and watching events from a different angle. Because in chapter 2, what we get is much more about God's relationship with mankind, his purpose for us, and our relationships with one another, his good design. And that's what we're going to consider this morning. And if you're following on the handout point number one, we're going to look first at, at what we learn about our relationship to God. What was it meant to be? And I think in, in these opening verses, what they're emphasising to us is that we are to understand ourselves as God's creatures. We are creatures made by our Creator. Now, I, I don't know, it might not sound very nice to think of yourself as a creature. But as you read verse 4 to 7 of chapter 2, I think that's the sense you get that our world is nothing without the intervention, without the creation of God. So look at verse 5. We start with the world in a somewhat negative state, don't we? There are no shrubs, no plants. Why? Well, because God needs to act. And the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no one to work the ground. Why was that? Well, again, because God needed to intervene. 
to create man. The Lord God is the chief actor here, isn't he? And he asked to create in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The picture is of a potter with clay. There's nothing accidental about what happens here, is there? It is deliberate, it's careful, it's considered creation. And it suggests God's care and his concern for what he creates. And the result is we are God's creatures, his creation. He's the potter, we're the clay, it's not the other way around. Now before we move on, let me just pause there for a moment and say something briefly about this man that God creates. Later on he's called Adam. I don't think there is anything to suggest in this text that this man is anything but a historical figure, a man who really existed. There are details in this text that we'll see later about the garden uh, that the man was placed in. There are geographical details that we're given which I think suggests to us that we're meant to read this as history, a place that existed, and a man that existed. And the rest of the Bible seems to corroborate that. You know, this man, Adam, appears in various genealogies. He appears in the Gospels as part of Jesus' genealogy. And the Apostle Paul also refers to Adam in some of the arguments that, that he makes in the New Testament. Everything in this chapter, in Genesis and the rest of the Bible, suggests this man really existed, the first man. And you might have questions about that. And you might have questions about these early chapters of Genesis, some of the other questions that you might have. And we are going to be arranging a time to address more of these questions um, that we can't always do in every sermon. So look out for details of that, and if you're signed up to the Friday newsletter, then you, you should get that in due course. But come and speak to me if you, if you want to chat more about this particular question, or if you've got other questions, I'll be happy to chat later. Having said that, let's get back to verse 7, it's the end of the pause, back to verse 7. We've seen that we're creatures, God has created this man, and we're meant to see in verse 7 that this uh, mankind it is completely dependent on God. We depend on him for our very life. So God breathes the breath of life into this man's nostrils. Notice, you see, God doesn't need anyone to breathe the breath of life into him, does he? That's the reason he can do it for us. Jesus said in the Gospels, in John's Gospel, that the Father has life in himself. But we, his creatures, are dependent on him. For our very breath, we are not independent creatures as much as we might feel that we are. And have a look at verse 9. We see God's generous provision for his creation. We're, we're dependent on God not just for breath, but for everything we need to sustain us. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. The Lord God places this man in this beautiful garden, a garden of paradise. And there's water, there's wealth, there's food, and there's even a tree of life, a tree that gives life. It's a place where he has all that he needs for life. We're God's creatures, we're dependent on him. And what we see here is a God who is graciously caring for and providing for the people that he has made. Now, as I said a minute ago, it might not sound very nice to think of yourself as a creature. Um, it's probably not a popular thing to say, because being a creature means being dependent on your creator. It means being under the authority of your creator. It means being owned by your creator. God has the ownership rights to your life. It's why God gets to decide our purpose and our significance. It's why he gets to decide who we are and what we're for. He's the potter. He's the owner. 
And you know, the reason why our world is in such a mess is because we've rebelled against this good design. We've stopped recognizing that we are creatures with a creator. And we started to think of ourselves as gods who are independent from him. More on that in chapter 3. Let's read it. But it's worth reminding ourselves, even if we're Christians here this morning, who, who know this to be true, it's worth remembering that we are creatures. We're dependent on God. We're limited beings. He sustains us. He gives us our every breath. He has generously provided for us. And that's a reason to worship him this morning, isn't it? To give him thanks. But there's more to this relationship. Not only is God our creator and our sustainer, but this chapter tells us that God has created us to know him. He's created us, actually, to dwell with him. So I wonder if you notice that in chapter 2, that God is referred to by a different name than he is in chapter 1. Did you notice that? In chapter 1, the repeated phrase was, and God said, or God saw. But now in chapter 2, throughout the chapter, he is called the Lord God. So verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Lord is, is capitalised in your Bibles because it represents God's name, Yahweh. The name that, that he revealed to his people. The name that represents the fact that he enters into covenant with his people, relationship with his people. He makes promises to his people. And so chapter 2 uses Lord God as his name because this is a chapter all about how God will relate to his people. How do we see God's desire for relationship in this chapter? It, it might sound like a strange thing, but the way we see it is in the details we're given about the place God puts them at, the Garden of Eden. You see, the, the first people who read this book, they were the people who lived at the time of Moses. Moses was the one who wrote these words. And these Israelites, as they read this description of the garden in verse 8 to 14 that we just read, they would have recognized lots and lots of similarities with the tabernacle. Details like the fact that the entrance to the garden, verse 8, was in the east. Just like the entrance to the tabernacle was in the east. And they were spotted that, verse 9, there were trees growing in this garden, in the middle of it, which was symbolised in the tabernacle by the lampstand. And they would notice, verse 12, that this garden had gold and onyx in it, which were stones used in the tabernacle. And they have seen in chapter 3, how this garden was guarded by the cherubim. Do you remember after Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, there was a cherubim to guard the garden, just like was in the tabernacle. The cherubim were, were stitched into the fabric of the tabernacle and they sat over the Ark of the Covenant. And most obviously the readers of this book would have noticed that this garden was the place where God was, just like in the tabernacle. See, the point is that this garden was not just meant to be a paradise for human beings. It was God's garden. It was meant to be the place where people would dwell with God. Just as they would later go to the tabernacle and the temple to meet God, well, here in this garden is the place where human beings would not, not just occasionally meet with God, but they'd live with God. It was what made the garden so good, not, not just the trees and the gold and the rivers, but that God was there. It was literally heaven on earth. God, Yahweh God, is a relational God. He has made his creatures to know him. And so this man that God has, has carefully made, he's placed, verse 8, lovingly placed, into this garden, God's dwelling place, to enjoy fellowship and communion with him. What's the meaning of life? We're talking here, Genesis 2. God made us to dwell with him. 
to know him as our creator, our king, and to depend on him for everything. We're made for relationship with God. This is God's good design. And that is why, you know, it's so foolish to cut ourselves off from the God who made us. Instead of being dependent on God, we try to live independently from him. Instead of living to know God, we, we've, we've turned our backs on him. And so, you know, so many people search in vain for the meaning of life. They, they try and fill that God-shaped hole with all sorts of things. But the answer's right here in Genesis 2. We're made to know God. Our relationship with God, ultimately what our lives are all about, is what we were made for. That's point number one. What about our purpose, point number two? What, what has God put us here to do? What has God put us here to do? Well, look at Genesis 2.15. I wonder how you feel about this. What did God put the man in the garden to do? Well, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Work. That's what we're here for. We're made to work. Now, now that might sound a bit uh, disappointing, especially as you contemplate what you're going to be doing tomorrow morning, perhaps. But it's true. God put the man in the garden to work. And this, this is before Genesis 3, isn't it? You know, however difficult work might be, it is, in this world, it is not in this world because of the fall. It was here before the fall. It was part of God's good design. Work is a fundamentally good thing. Lots of time we think of work as a necessary evil. You know, we have, we, we have to do it, but we'd rather be on the beach in the Bahamas. And we, we'd like to think that we're made to relax. But Genesis 2 tells us that in God's good design, we were made to work. And that, that means, I think, that we can say there is dignity in work. Not just fancy suits work, or well-paid work, but unpaid work as well. Study work, looking after children work. All work has value in God's world. But there's more to Adam's job than simply being a gardener. Look again at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now, to us, that just sounds like the job of a gardener. But again, to the Israelites who first read this book, it would have reminded them of the tabernacle. Because you know that phrase, to work it and to take care of it, or, or to serve it and to guard it. It is a phrase that whenever it appears, whenever it appears in the early books of the Bible, it is always talking about the job of a priest. A priest who is to serve and guard God's holy place, just like Adam was. He wasn't simply a guard there. He was a priest in God's holy place. And his job was not just to serve the ground, but to serve God. The job of a priest is to mediate, to go between God and creation. Adam's job was to mediate God's blessing to the world, to enable the world, the whole world, to enjoy the blessing of God. He was, was enjoying fellowship and communion with God in the garden, and Adam's job was to make everything outside the garden like inside the garden, to bring everything under the blessing of God. He was given a command in verse 16. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Adam, the priest, he was given God's word, and he was to proclaim God's word. He was to ensure that everybody knew God's commandment. Do you remember back in chapter 1? God made mankind in his image. Adam is God's representative in the world. His job is to rule the world on Adam's behalf, on God's behalf. 
And his job as priest is to help the world know God. His job is to fill the earth with many, many, many more faithful image-bearing priests who would obey God and enjoy God. And this is, is God's good design, not just for Adam, but for everyone. Human beings are made to serve God, to help the world know God and enjoy Him. You might not have thought of yourself as a priest, and probably you've not put that on your CV, and if you've got a CV, but you are. It's what you were made for. Think about when you have a conversation with someone about Jesus, trying to tell them the gospel, or a conversation with someone after church, encouraging them with something from God's word. Think about maybe you help teach children in ABC and discover. Or you teach your own children at home, looking at the Bible with them. Think about the times you pray for the world, for your church, for your family, for your friends, for your colleagues. Even this week at Prayer Central, we're meeting to do this work of mediating God's blessing to the world. However insignificant you might think all those things are, this is the work of greatest significance. It's God's very good design for humanity. It's what we were made for. Finally, a look at point number three. These closing verses are here to show us that this work, this work that we're created to do, is not a one man job. Look at verse 18 with me. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. At this point in the story, this is the first time something is not good. And so the Lord God created the woman, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought it into the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice a few things uh, with me. Firstly, why did God create a woman? It's not because Adam was lonely. That's not the point of verse 18. Let's look back to verse 18. It wasn't good that Adam was alone because he couldn't do the job of working and keeping the garden on his own. It was not a one-man job. Men and women are both needed in God's world for all sorts of things, in all sorts of areas. And especially here in Genesis 2.15, Adam couldn't do the work of, of taking care of the garden on his own. He couldn't be priest on his own. He couldn't do the work of ruling on his own. And quite obviously, he couldn't do the work of filling the earth on his own. Both genders are needed for that task. Which is, again, what we saw last week, chapter 1, verse 27. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Both men and women together bear God's image. They're God's representatives. Together, both are needed. Now, it's really important we see that in our time and day, isn't it? Our time, our, our culture. Because people today increasingly say gender is a social construct. It's not. It's God's invention. It's part of his good design for his world. It's not something we can do away with. And secondly, notice, number two, this, this man and this woman are not interchangeable, but complementary beings. Their difference in gender is not inconsequential, but it is essential for the task. Look again at verse 18. God says he must create a helper suitable for him. Or as some other translations put it, someone corresponding to him. Someone like him, 
but also somewhat different from him. Already there's a sense in verse 18 that these two will have different roles to play. There's an order in creation, an order in this family. And the command was given to Adam, and the woman is given to help him. But she has to be like him, equal to him, and different from him. And that's why, in verse 19 and 20, when all the animals were brought before Adam, no suitable helper was found. There was no helper corresponding to him, because they were like him. But crucially, when God makes the woman, he doesn't make another man. He doesn't make an exact replica. And that seems to be what the man celebrates about her in verse 23. She is like him, but she's different from him. She's equal to him. She's made of the same stuff as him. They both equally bear God's image. But she is his complement. She's his opposite. Men and women are both needed to be God's priests in the world. And it's the fact that they're equal but different that makes them suitable for this task. And it's the fact that they're equal but different that is the basis for human marriage. Look at verse 24. Moses adds in a narrator's comment, doesn't he? Verse 24. That is why... The fact that the woman was a compliment to the man, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. These two, equal and opposite man and woman, are brought together in marriage as one flesh. It's talking about sexual union, but it's saying that these two form a new family unit. In a sense, it's not just a union, it's a reunion. The woman who was taken out of the man is now joined to him. Now these verses are saying something specifically about Adam and Eve's marriage. This man and woman are brought together, and their marriage is to be an essential part of God's plan to fill the earth with many, many image-bearing priests. Adam and Eve are together to rule and fill the earth with people who know God and enjoy him like they do. But also, verse 24 is telling us something about God's design for marriage generally. You were not to think that somehow marriage is, is the ideal, because the New Testament is very clear that singleness is to be commended. But as far as marriage goes, this is the blueprint. Jesus himself says that. He picks up on this verse in speaking about marriage. And he's he's telling us, this verse is telling us that this first marriage is the blueprint for all marriage and for sex. So we see here in verse 24 that marriage must be between a man and a woman. Because it's the joining together of the equal and opposite man and woman. And we see that the only place for sex is within this marriage union. The bringing together of two people to form a permanent family union. Verse 25 might seem like a strange way to end the chapter, but, but it's there to show just how good this all is. Actually, our culture might not think this is good, but it was. Adam and Eve are in the garden, unashamed of who they are and what they are which I think is a world we all crave, isn't it? Nothing to hide, nothing to fear. They really were who they wanted to be in that garden. As we end, let's try and draw all this together. Chapter 2, Genesis 2, shows us God's good design. It shows us we were made to know God as our creator. We were made to dwell with him. It shows us we were made to serve him as priests in the world. And it shows us we were made to do this work together, men and women. But the thing is, we're not in the garden now, are we? That was God's good design. But it goes without saying that we've rejected God's good design. And the consequences have been disastrous. Disastrous. 
We don't enjoy the relationship with God like we should do, and so we search in vain for the meaning of life. We serve ourselves instead of serving Him, and our relationships with one another have broken down. We live in a world where people are ashamed of who they are. We're not in the garden anymore. And that is because, as we'll see next week, this first family, this first family here in Genesis 2 failed in their task. They didn't work and keep the garden like they should have. They didn't fill the earth with faithful image-bearing priests. But the good news, the good news is there's a better Adam who comes through a new family, a faith family, Abraham's family, and ultimately Jesus' family. And through this family, and through this better Adam, we can enjoy what was lost in paradise. We can only enjoy it now, in part. We will enjoy it fully in the future, in God's place, with God's people, enjoying God's blessing again. Let me pray.